Guys, we are so excited to have Jordan with us here today. He should be on a beach celebrating somewhere, but he took time out of his schedule to come speak with us today. So Jordan is the co-founder of Outlet Baby Care, where he raised $50 million in venture capital and recently $300 million via the public markets. With a stellar team, Outlet has grown the business from zero to nine figures. Jordan enjoys discovering how the interplay of human psychology, business strategy, and emerging technology leads to disruptive businesses. Jordan loves to root for entrepreneurs as a friend, advisor, or investor. So give it up for our special guest, Jordan. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh, let's check the microphone real quick. Let's see. There we go. We're right. in business. Perfect. Jordan, thanks for being here. No um, it's my understanding that you got into the business world and Owlet specifically at a young age. Is this true? Yes. Um, I wasn't that kid that was like selling lemonade stands as a kid. It's kind of the opposite. Um, my parents, like, they started a gas station uh, when I was really young and it failed and they like mortgaged their house and it was like the, the sad story. So my whole life, it was like, never start a business, do something really safe. But like, I was, I was at BYU, and I took this like intra entrepreneurship class, and I was like, I dig this. Like, I just am so just fascinated by all of this. And uh, so yeah, we started, we started Outlet right out of uh, college. So, did your, we'll we'll say, did your youth impact your ability to start or bring up any challenges within starting a business? Um, yeah, I think I had this, like, fear, um, from, like, my parents that was, like, always present, but sometimes that's good. You want, like, that productive paranoia that keeps you on your toes, but, um, but at the same time, my mom was, like, an entrepreneur herself and was, like, you can do anything, you know, just, you can do it, and I think it's hard enough to start a business, and you almost have to have that, uh, mindset of, yeah, I, I can get this done in order to be successful as an entrepreneur. So, so two young men coming out of college, yes, starting a business focused on baby care. Where did the inspiration for Outlet come from? Yeah, so my co-founder, Kurt, uh, his wife has had uh, three heart surgeries. And you can actually, you, if you meet her, she's got the, a scar, you know, it's kind of, you just you notice it every, every time you meet her. Um, and when she was a baby, they, uh, her mom just happened to walk in at the right time and, and she was blue, um, had an undiagnosed heart condition and they rushed her to the hospital and did surgery that, that same day. Um, and Kurt is, uh, even more, uh, paranoid sounds, sounds mean, but like Kurt was thinking to himself, you know, how am I, how would I ever know if something was wrong? Um, and then saw this technology and, and said, well, I think that that'll work. So from that point, kind of from the ideation up to where you are now, um, what pivots did you have to make? Um, I'd say that the there's there's a lot. One of them early on was should this be a medical device, um, and that's something that like to this day, you know, we still go back and forth on just how much you, we invest into that part of our business and, and how much stays on the consumer side. Um, but we went back and forth on that. We initially said, um, doesn't need to be a medical device, it's a pulse oximeter. And, and then we you know, talked to a bunch of people in pulse oximetry and, and they said, no, it does. If it has an alarm, it needs to. And, uh, and it almost derailed us. Like we, we couldn't have really, there wasn't really anything there. People wouldn't want our device if it, just, if it didn't have an alarm on it. And we talked to one entrepreneur and kind of successful entrepreneur and he was like, there's no rules here. Like, there's no, like, the FDA doesn't have anything written out specific here. You're in a gray space. And so you can move forward, but just know that you're taking a risk-based approach. Um, and that's, that was a, a major pivot of whether or not this, this device should have an alarm or whether or not it's kind of like a Fitbit for your baby. Um, and we're, we're glad we, we made that choice. So. So obviously there were a lot of pivots. Obviously there's a lot of struggle within building and growing a business from the ground up. So what was the hardest moment that you came across during your business building process? Gosh. Um, 
the early phases are super fun, um, but they're also just like whiplash too. They're, they're they're really hard. You guys are just in the hardest times. Um, so many times we just you know we're completely let down. I can remember when when we were like, oh, this needs FDA clearance. It'll cost a million dollars. And just like oh, the room, the air is just let out of out of us completely. I'd say one of the hardest times was we were uh, we. <laughs> We built, we did a crowdfunding campaign. So we had a th about like a thousand or two thousand people who had pre-ordered this device. We took their money, and we s ordered materials to build the devices. Materials showed up, and we started building. So we had thousand pieces of, of silicone, a thousand electronics pieces, and we're like, we're at our accelerator in New York City, and we're we're piecing them together. And, you know, it's this exciting moment. We build our first one, and we put it on a baby. And uh, we immediately find two problems. The first one is that when you put Bluetooth radios at the time, when you strap it onto a baby's shin, the body, the water in the body absorbs the, the RF signal. And we went from, in our lab testing of having, you know, plenty of room, I think like our, our, our lab was like as big as this room and, and we could reach all the way across, to when we put it on a baby, we had like two feet. Like, and you had to hold your phone. You had to leave your phone two feet from your baby all night. Like, it was just useless. And then to make matters worse, when you put it on a baby the third time, you broke the electronics. They could only withstand three uses before it broke. Now, we've spent other people's money at this point. Uh, we're in New York City. We've spent all of our own investors' money at this point. We've done, like, yeah. And we're like, I guess we go to jail now. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what's what's next? That was that was a freaky time, and we had like weeks, you know, a few weeks of money left, and it was like, you know, we're going around the table, like I I can go this many weeks without pay, I can go this, and we're we're taking like twelve dollar an hour salary. It's not like a big salary, but, um, yeah, like that was a that was a pretty scary time. <laughs> so where did you go from there? What do those conversations look like, and how did you recover from that time? I think you fake it till you make it. I mean, we were we had a some early investor interest in, in New York City. And I remember, in fact, there was a group that wanted to give us a stiff deal. They wanted to give us like a shark deal. And I mean, we're like sitting with this dilemma and that wasn't you know, enough money to like make it happen. But we knew that that deal would have muffed up the rest of the deals because it was such a low valuation that ever, you know, it would have ruined everything else. And, and we had the guts to say no to that. And then within a few weeks, we got two yeses on half million dollar checks and then from there, the rest of the money just just fell through, right? Like the everyone was like, "Cool, there's two big checks in. I'm in." You know, everyone just threw their money over the table, and we got uh, two two point one million dollars in our seed seed round. So, um, yeah, getting those first yeses are the hardest the hardest ones. So, so after that initial fundraising campaign, where you had thousands of people place pre orders. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of had to go through this process of backtracking and re-raising money and doing things like this. So of those thousands and thousands of people who've placed orders, who were they? What was the demographic? Who's, who is your target audience and how do you reach them? For us, I mean, so that specific time, it was like these early adopters are just like, it's okay, keep my money, it's okay, it's delayed. Like, I just, I just think this is cool. Um, and that's very different than what it is today. Um, so do you want back then or today? Let's do both. Yeah, back then it's just these like early adopter people love technology. I joke that like almost any 3D printer can make a million dollars on Kickstarter now. It's just like there's just got this group of people that love to support the early phases of stuff. Uh, and then we take a subsegment of those people and those who had babies or were planning on having babies, and that was our customer. But today our customer, um, you know, is it probably falls into like two classes of people. The first is um, someone who is, you know, a little bit more concerned and is more, uh, they're actually very proactive about their parenting. Um, and they, they think through what could go wrong and they try to proactively, you know, uh, work against that. The other group of people would be people who maybe have a baby with some type of condition or maybe nothing big. Maybe the baby was born premature and they spend a few weeks in the NICU and they just say, you know what? I've got a reason to be a little more anxious, and I'd like I'd like some extra peace of mind uh, for my baby. So that's kind of the maybe the two categories. From from my experience with working with railroad portfolio companies, a lot of times figuring out how to communicate and reach 
specifically parents, if that is your target audience, can be difficult. Yeah. So what has been the challenge with you reaching and engaging with this target audience? And um, what were some solutions that you found? Yeah, so for us, like, <laughs> we, we were really lucky in that our first marketing hire was a jack of all trades. He wasn't someone who was like a pay-per-click monster who would just do really good at like pay-per-click. Because I almost did hire that guy, and luckily I didn't. But uh, you still have to solve that. Like that's what you have to go figure out is how you know how do you find customers and and what's what's the nut to crack there. And uh, so for us, we started down this road of trying to go for existing demand. So go in places where people are already there. So Amazon, great example. You're searching for a baby monitor, pay-per-click. You're searching for a baby monitor, boom, there's our ad. That worked horribly. We, Our cost per acquisition, granted, it's a $250 device at the time. Now it's $300. But it costs us $1,000 to get a customer in on pay-per-click ads at this time. Another moment where we thought we were totally hosed. You know, where those We spent sixty grand and in like a weekend. And because we, the way we tested it, we tested it really fast. And we were just like, oh, no. Um, <laughs> And but what was interesting is we learned that it, when people are in existing demand didn't work, we had to go create the demand. So we had to go market on Facebook and create this awareness around this this problem, this idea, and then they would go transact later on our website. And that in a, a case like uh, pay per click or or Amazon, people are they're thinking baby monitor, baby monitor, baby monitor. What's the sock thing? Baby monitor, baby monitor, baby monitor. They just it just broke their model and it didn't work for them. But Creating demand on Facebook or other avenues like that to drive people over to our funnel, that worked really well um, and was and, and continues to be uh, cost effective. But yeah. So I've heard part of what you are the most passionate about is seeing how the product helps parents and helps children. So what is one of the coolest stories that you're willing to share that you've seen as a result of the Outlet product? Oh, man. So many stories. Uh, we literally have a book at our office of stories that have come from parents. Hey, Scott. Um, that have come from parents that um, where if the outlet wasn't there, they don't know if their baby would be alive today. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, these are stories that like are emotional to even even tell people about. Um, but you know, one mom uh, has was fell asleep while breastfeeding because she had taken Percocet because of the C-section to deliver her baby and didn't realize she'd kind of fallen asleep and the baby was being smothered by her breast. Um, another one where um, parent just, you know, the alarm went off and, and thought, hmm, that, that's weird. Like, it was just in there. Walks in and, and the baby has spit up for some reason, but, you know, like a halo of, of vomit ar around the baby. And, and the baby's looking kind of that, that pale blue and she's able to go and, and intervene, you know, for her child. So um, just, I mean, I could tell story after story. We have one story, uh, it's very unique. One person actually put it on her grandmother, who uh, had a terminal illness and was, was living at home. She had, was at work. The alarm went off, and she got on her phone. She knew that she uh, could go home and spend the last few hours with her mom before her mom passed away. So um, just story after story, really, really fun stuff. That's incredible. And it's clear that the product is very effective and helpful within the family, which leads me to imagine that as a founding team, you and your partner are very... Um, very much family people. So talk to me about the work-life balance. How did you figure out how to be present and there with your family while also starting a booming business? Yeah, that's hard. And there's there's four founders, by the way, so um, yes. and all with, all, all with kids as well. But um, it's hard. I mean, this this is all-consuming, and you... You put you start to put your self worth in this business as well. It becomes a reflection of you as a person. Um, you know, for me, uh, I and everyone you, you've got to figure it out out differently. But you know, I I get home, I put my phone away, and you know, I, I'm not checking the phone between you know six o'clock and eight o'clock when my kids go to bed. And when you put it in that perspective, it's like I get two hours of quality hours with my kids every day. That's kind of pretty small when you think about it. Um, I can make time for, for other things later, but um, it's just, and, and even being present mentally, like it don't, it's a habit and a muscle you have to build to like turn off the work brain and just be here, like be with your, your, your kids or, or, or your spouse. Um, 
So I, I, it's a muscle that you have to go build because it's the entrepreneurship stuff might come easy for you. It's easy to get lost in your business and get excited and, and spend all day and, and nights on it. But, you know, you can turn that off for a few hours and, you know, they fall asleep and you can turn it back on if you need to. So. I, th- <laughs> <laughs> I think as entrepreneurs, the businesses that we start, that we build, become another one of our children, per mm-hmm. se. Um, and so as you have been raising this business child from the ground, um, what are some principles of business and entrepreneurship that you've learned and that you continue to live by? Um, maybe just speaking to the babies thing, you know, I, I try to say don't let it be your baby, both from the early phases when it's just an idea. You know, Scott used to teach us this, too, is like, you know, don't treat it like your baby. Treat it like something that's going to steal your resources. You know, I think you used the analogy once of a girlfriend that might marry you and you need to make sure that you really like this person because you'll, you'll be hitched to him for a long time. Similar with like your business idea, like go vet it out and don't, don't let it be a sacred cow just because you thought of it. Um, and then on, on the other side, you know, there's so much luck in business. I think, uh, I think what's his name? says anyone can be a, a millionaire, but it takes real luck to be a billionaire. And I, I'd say similar with like entrepreneurs, you know, I've been through a lot of like accelerators and and from BYU up to like other groups. And then each of our investors, I have like these sister companies, right? And so I've got a lot of entrepreneurs that I've been watching from the sidelines over like, you know, almost 10 years now. And some of the smartest groups do almost everything right. And sometimes they still fail. You know, COVID hits and all of a sudden you're, you're, travel business makes zero sense, you know, but your telehealth business makes perfect sense, right? And so luck is just such a big factor that I just hope no one writes too much of their own self-worth into the success of this business because, man, there, there's a lot of pieces where I'm like, that guy is twice as smart as me, and it's just luck that his business didn't work out and, and mine did. Um, now, obviously, there's like a, a base element of work ethic and, and other things that are needed, but there's also just a lot of luck involved, and so maybe don't get too married to the idea that it's it's your baby. So, um, in your intro, we mentioned that you are a friend of entrepreneurs, and that really sounds a lot like a mentor as well. So, who within your career was a major player, mentor, or influence in your career? Oh man, so many people. Scott was an awesome one. I'd love that that I get to see Scott here to like take me back to all those awesome memories at BYU. But um, I. I feel like entrepreneurs don't reach out enough. I, w- I would say I've probably never rejected an entrepreneur that sent an, a, a blind email and says, hey, just want your feedback here. And as I look back, I wish I would have done more of that. I think and because there's no way to learn how to fundraise. There's no book out there that says, here's how you raise money in Utah. Here's how you raise money in New York. And here's how you raise money in San Francisco. It doesn't exist. Um, well, maybe, but I haven't seen it. And... Um, there's like there's secrets to the trade of of each of these things, and the only way you learn it is by asking someone who's a little bit ahead of you. And then you can get a lot of knowledge from people who are ten years ahead of you, but you can actually get even more knowledge from people who are a year or two ahead of you who have just went through that Series A or just went through whatever that that thing is. It's a little misty for me some of those those steps in the business, but um, and each each level of the game keeps changing, and so you should always be trying to bring around you people that you can just pick their brain advisors are the cheapest the the cheapest uh advice you'll ever get you can give them you know what amounts to essentially free advisor stock for you and they will give you the keys to the kingdom they'll give you some amazing piece of information that you can't even find anywhere you can't read these things anywhere so um i'd say go find smart sharp people say i want to make you an advisor and pick their brain once a week. Say, we're thinking this, this, or this. Can you can you give me some direction? And and sometimes that feels like a lot. It feels heavy to do that, but I think it's worth it. Well, I think it's only fair that since we have you here, we pick your brain a little bit. So sure. what advice would you give to entrepreneurs looking to raise capital? Um, man, a lot. The... Well, that, sorry, I didn't even answer your last question of who helped us. We had a lot of people along the route. There was one guy specifically, uh, McKay Thomas, that we that is he's actually comes out of Utah but lives in San Francisco now. We had been trying to fundraise for a while. We we actually flew out to San Francisco to have like I think six meetings that day, 
and we had three meetings in the morning. We met with him at lunchtime and then three meetings in the afternoon. And the meetings in the morning, they basically said no before the day, before the meeting was over. And the ones in the afternoon after we'd met with McKay, they basically chased us out of the room. Like, we'd love to, like, when can we meet next? You know, it's just like this very different dynamic. Um, and I think, you know, uh, gosh, fundraising at every level is different. So, like, the 300 million IPO right now is like in some ways was similar, but it, in other ways it was very different from getting $50,000 from an angel. Um, but I, my advice is that you get more money than you, th you know, the joke is like twice as much as you think you'll need because it, you'll spend it all and it'll even more. And that was, that's definitely been our case. We've always spent more than we thought we needed because stuff takes longer. Um, so my thing would say raise more money, um, try to build your network, you know, both within Utah and outside of Utah. I think entrepreneurs are great references to investors because they've all raised a lot of money themselves, so they have this investor network and they can they can connect you to, to investors really easily. If you ask an investor for a connection to another investor, the first thing they ask them is, did you invest? Well, no, I didn't invest. Oh, I'm not investing, <laughs> right? So getting it from an entrepreneur oftentimes is, is, a, is a better connection, so... So recently, IPO. Congratulations, Thank first you. of all. Very exciting. Um, what business factors did you evaluate when making the decision to go public? Yeah, we we didn't think we were ready for something like that. And one of our board members was a sharp guy in like October. He was like, we should be thinking about this. I think the business is ready. And we we're like, no, no, that's like grown up stuff. We can't do that. <laughs> and then uh, we he was smart and he had us, we talked to five different banks. We talked to like Morgan Stanley and Bank of America and, you know, all, all the kind of the big ones. And they looked at our, you know, they did these kind of sales calls to try and get us to work with them as our banker. And they, each of them were like, yeah, we think this is a great business. You can you can definitely go public in the next 18 months. And so we started down that road. We, we agreed with Bank of America and said, okay, let's start down that road. And then we met with this SPAC, which um, SPACs are now making it so companies like us can go public maybe a year sooner than we might have. Um, and still take on lots and lots of money. So we're getting $300 million sooner than, than you know, we would have via public market. And the other, you know, the other piece is timing. You know, the market is really good right now. It's a great time to join us back or to go public uh, the traditional way. So um, I think all those kind of factored in there. What benefits do you see on the horizon as a result of the IPO? Um, I think with $300 million, we have the ability, we will have the ability to make much bigger bets um, and uh, kind of consolidate this category. Uh, you know, I, we're kind of serving this underserved category. If you go into like a baby store, you almost feel like you went back a few generations. Like all this, all the electronics are like cheap stuff from China that's just been like slapped a brand on and... Um, we have the opportunity to like really build it the way that maybe Apple might have built something in in the nursery and, and really do it in a thoughtful way and, and in a way that will really help parents. Um, and I think, yeah, this money is going to allow us to really execute on that vision. So You touched a little bit on how right now is a great time to say go public. There's a lot of opportunity. And I think some entrepreneurs are struggling to see that as we come out of a really hard time. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what silver linings or opportunities you see on the horizon for our entrepreneurs? Yeah. Um, gosh, it's been such a crazy year, you know, with um, a lot of businesses I've just seen go to zero really quickly, and a lot of businesses have just blown up overnight. A lot of consumer businesses, even like Traeger and Skullcandy, or, you know, their sales are up 30% because people are sitting at home just buying more stuff. You know, they're not going out. They're not spending their money going out and doing things. And so... Um, I think, yeah, I, I think there's just so much opportunity, even, even in those moments of COVID, you know, where in those early days when, when we were all kind of freaking out on what this might mean, there was a lot of people that were like, what's the opportunity here? And that's, and that's, I think where some entrepreneurs, uh, really shine as they say, like one, one friend started a mask company, like day two into COVID, he was calling mask manufacturers and like getting that, that solved. Um, and it worked out for him, you know, and there, another friend, uh, started a telehealth company. He was like, he could kind of see through that, that that was me an option. Telehealth is just, you know, blown up massively. Um, and so, uh, 
I just think there's there's always opportunity when the market uh, you see these kind of major shifts. The, the smart entrepreneurs saying, "What does that mean for this industry?" Or what you know, trying to see around corners that way. So, so uh, throughout your entire experience, from being a student to becoming a founder of an incredible business, what is one of the greatest lessons you've learned? Man, there's probably a lot of there's probably a lot of lessons. Um, Man, I, I just think that um, it it's weird being, you know, talking to a group of founders and think just going through what I just went through where we announced this IPO and it was about 12 hours of fun. It was like 12 hours of like celebration, high fives, and it was like back to work. And I was like, it was it was a little weird because I'd looked up to this day for, for so long um, and... I think that it's it's great it's it's you know massive financial change for my family and and I think that's that's going to be great. I know a lot of really happy like normal people who just have like normal jobs and I know a lot of really happy entrepreneurs and I also know a lot of really sad entrepreneurs as well. Um and I I almost think if you think that happiness is on the other side of the acquisition or whatever that is um you'll probably be sorely uh, uh, surprised. And probably one of the best pieces of advice I got was from a friend who sold his company uh, at like, when I was four years into my company more or less, or yeah, about that. And so he had just hit the, and I was looking at him like, whoa, like, is there a pot of gold? Like, what's it like with the leprechauns at the end of this rainbow? And he's like, it's like, it's not that big of a deal. Like, you're, you're, the same stuff still makes you sad. The same stuff still makes you, you know, happy. And he was like, invest in yourself now. And I, at that point, um, I started, like, investing in just working out. I started investing in, like, meditation. I started investing in, like, my personal relationships with my family and my, my friends. And just, it was so helpful for me to s hear that at the four-year mark instead of where a lot of people realize it, which is at the end of the 10-year mark. And they've lost their friends. They've, they've lost their health. They've lost these other pieces that, that make life so rich. Um, go kill it. Go, you know, go kill it in your, in your business and, and have fun doing it, but just take care of yourself along the way. You know, don't, don't do it at the expense of, of you. So, um, yeah. I love that. I think that's really important. And a beautifully said, beautifully said. Um, I want to open it up for some audience questions before we run out of time. So if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. And we have some incredible mic runners who will run a mic to you. Please do not touch it. They will hold it in front of you. We are being very germ conscious here. So if you have a question, go ahead, throw your hand up, and we will get a mic to you. All right. Uh, what would be some of your lessons learned on uh, how to maybe ways that you uh, hindered sales in the early days versus how you would have sped those up now knowing what you know. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of a believer that you should really nail your business before you start turning on the sales engine, and it's different for like hardware versus software. Maybe, and you have to take these with a grain of salt and how it applies to your business. But the moment you do start selling something, all of a sudden, like, attention and resources go to that thing. And maybe the bigger thing that you wanted to do later or, like, the expanded vision is really put on pause until you can take, you know, resources away from what you've now, you've now made a baby that needs to eat every day and needs, you know, care and stuff. And this other stuff is just a thought that, you know, doesn't exist yet. And so... Um, sometimes it can it can be a problem if you go to revenue too quickly. Um, if you know in your heart of hearts from all your customer interviews and everything you've done that the expanded vision is maybe something a bit bigger. So I think launching and starting revenue at the right time is really key. Had we so one example for us, we you know had our early units that were getting out in the field, and our net promoter score, which is like this rate of how we rate like happiness of with the with the product was like in the 30s, it was really low. And it was hard because we were running out of money and we were like, let's just start making money so then we can use that to fund getting the product better and you know all these things. And uh, we decided to stop 
cut money wherever we could. A lot of people went part time, and and um, we saved money wherever we could. I, I don't I don't think we took on any investment, but we said we got to get the the ex- user experience needs to be better before we really launch this thing. And we stopped. Took more took more time. It was it was kind of a scary thing to do. It was hard to fire people. Hard to ask people to go part time. Um, but then we got that net promoter score up to like a 60, 70 experience, you know, a really like game changing experience. It's like what Apple experience is. And then when we launched the first investor who used our product, that ended up being our, our series A investor that gave us $6 million. Had he used the previous version of the product, it never would have happened. So, um, one from fundraising two from like, once it's out in the market, People judge it pretty quickly. We, we judge products almost like we judge people. You know, like that first few interactions, you, you decide if you like them or not, you know? So I think your product is the same. And again, tons of caveats there. You might be able to do it um, in a lot of cases with software. You might be able to do it if you've got a way to keep it in beta and then, and then launch it separately. Like, like don't, don't take these like ironclad rules. But, um, but yeah, just know that, you know, timing that launch at the right time really, really matters. Thanks. Jordan, congratulations. What an amazing time. Uh, and I wanted to make a comment uh, so that everybody might might know this because it goes to your last comment that uh, uh, the Owlet team was the second uh, uh, team that went through our business model winner of the b- that came through our business model competition and the international business model competition at Brigham Young, which they won. And ever after, it became the gold standard in fact, over all the years, although we had an, a, a lot of amazing pitches, none of them ever surpassed the Owlet model of 2013. And the point I wanted to make here is the, is the point that Jordan make, made when he talked about product market fit. Because he, they, the team did such a remarkable job of learning and understanding the customer, then they were able to actually make that, uh, uh, that journey equal what they presented on the stage. Doesn't happen very often, but they did it. And uh, all of us are so proud of you, Jordan, about what you've done and uh, what you've demonstrated to the marketplace. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'd agree. The product market fits key. You know, one of our, our early marketing guys was like, this product is the best marketing tool I've ever had because it just it screams for for itself. So, and thank you, Scott, for everything. You know, we there's no way we could have done this without Scott. I can't tell you how many times I was like, wait, so what's rev like? Why does revenue matter? And you know, just like I don't know, like <laughs> the most basic questions. You know, Scott slowed it down. You know, and uh, ripped me a new one a lot of times, but it's what we needed. So it's good. Hey, congratulations. This is a really exciting story to hear. So I was wondering, where do you sell your products right now? Yeah, so we sell it on our website, um, Amazon, basically anywhere we'd get like baby products. So Amazon, Target, uh, we're in like 300 Walmarts and expanding, and then um, Bye Bye Baby, those kind of stores. So. Jordan, great job. We've enjoyed hearing your story. Um, you mentioned early on that one of your key hires was this marketing person, which is near and dear to my heart. Love to hear that. What were some of your other pivotal key hires in your early days that really helped you launch to success? Yeah. I mean, Owlet was built in the early days on interns. So, I mean, pizza and I- pizza was like our currency, too. I mean, we just got so much done with pizza. Um, and I remember we'd raised our... Uh, our seed round, or, or sorry, our Series A, and so it was like, okay, we're gonna really get into the market, and we had looked at hiring someone who, who luckily, I think it was Jeremy Andrus was like, don't hire so and so, like, you you've got the money, go hire a VP from Zag or from Skull Candy or from, go hire someone that's great, and that, that kind of scared us, and he was, this is Tom Bishop. He came from Skull Candy. He was our, our VP of operations. He was like one of our first grown-ups, as we called it. And 
just like knew how like an actual business should run. But it's, you know, that phase from going from, you're basically a dev company at first. You're just a development team. You're, you're designers, product people, and developers. You build something. But then transitioning to, we build stuff, we have to have the operations piece, we have to have human resources, sales, you know, finance, like, Although that's a that's a scary time. It's actually a big jump that you make because you have to hire all these functions. Um, but yeah, our, our VP of operations was was a big one. And I think it up so many times our vision had to get up leveled. I think it uh you know, leaving, you know, before we entered our accelerator, we were just like, Yeah, we're just gonna sell like a thousand of these and then we'll, you know, get by and we'll use that money to make another thousand and uh you know, Techstars helped up level our vision, say, go raise a million bucks and go build the world's best thing, you know, and do it right the first time. And this is another like up level of our vision of like, go hire someone that's just fantastic and he's going to, uh, you know, he or she's going to do a fantastic job in creating that organization underneath you. Um, and you hear this all the time and it doesn't really apply until you get to that stage, but man, getting those, those big boy hires are just so key and, and, can be so impactful to business. So, thanks for asking that one. I'm curious to know, um, you know, in Greg's presentation, he thought taught about how to design the details and um, and the execution. How did you get your vision? At one point, tell us about how th what that looked like for you for your vision and making it scalable um, for your your company to to grow. Um. You mean the vision to building the product or the vision to, like, ex the fundraising piece, or I don't know? Building of the product and, and, and expanding. Um, what's interesting is, like, our vision has actually changed over time, and partly because of fundraising. Um, you know, we went to investors and said, okay, we've got this baby product. They're okay, baby product, 250, 4 million babies born. It's a billion-dollar market opportunity. It's too small. We're like, okay. Um, and and that almost forced us to expand our vision so that we could get money to go build what we really cared about, which was the smart sock thing, but we you know kind of had this expanded vision. And just you know, just recently, under basically, you know, not a lot has changed in the business, but we're able to sell all these bankers at Fidelity and T Row Price and BlackRock and say, We've got an eighty billion dollar market. You know, these are the same, you know, it's the same essentially the same business, um, but we've expanded our vision to understand that, well, we're not just this one sock company. We actually have this opportunity to build out and connect all the devices in the nursery. And we have this opportunity within telehealth that we're seeing into the health of every single baby. And now we can, um, you know, connect you to the doctor in, in those key moments, you know. And so, um, but... I think we were really keen on what we knew really well, which is we've got something hot with this baby monitor, this sock, and it, it's hard to tell that expanded vision early on, but it's okay that your vision evolves over time. Like we didn't have that $80 billion vision day one, and it took us time to even see it ourselves. And I think that's okay, you know? Um, and other people can teach you stuff about your business and, and um, yeah, and, and I'll even talk to entrepreneurs sometimes, too, and say, no, you've got a bigger business here. Look, if you set this up as a recurring revenue model that has these elements, it's massive. What do you mean it's only this size, you know? And it's okay that sometimes you don't see it, and it can evolve over time. And you'll feel like a fraud yourself to be, like, telling someone, like, yeah, it's this really big opportunity. Uh, uh, I don't know <laughs> if it really is. Um, and I don't know. I, I just think it's okay for your business vision to expand over time. Okay, I've got a question for you. Jordan, it's so good hey. to have you here. Thanks. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to take a little bit of executive privilege and ask two questions. The okay. first one is, is that Al real? No. CGI. <laughs> <laughs> Photoshop. Okay. Um, secondly, um, you've shared some really great insights today and some fantastic guidance with all of us on a number of different uh, items from your experience at Outlet. Can you rewind the clock just a little bit and share a little bit about your experience and your, your insights on uh, phone soap? Yeah. And then, if you're willing, also fast forward a little bit. Life post outlet. What's next? What's, what's there? Yeah, cool. Um, 
So fake owl. Um, so phone soap was 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 really cool. I had just taken John Richards' class at BYU, and I was like, I love this entrepreneurship thing. I'm just like, and so I walked in. There was four people pitching at this event, and I said, I'm gonna hitch my wagon to the one I like the most. And Wesley got up there and pitched, and he. I remember the market size. I was like, oh, yeah, he's right. If we only get one percent of this market, it's it's just so big. And so I hitch. I walked up to him. and I said, I want to be an intern. Like, I don't even care if I don't know anything. Like, just let me stick around. I'll, f- I'll fill up the waters, you know. Um, and I guess I guess Wesley liked me because later uh, he went to BYU Jerusalem and uh, and he said, there's all these, B- these competitions at BYU and we want to win some money. And we actually like to make you a co-founder and, and you know, give you a little bit more equity. Um, and I was like, yes. I mean, I went from filling up the waters to co-founder. I feel great. Um but I think I think just like that exposure at a young age when um, it didn't matter if I was making money, the risk was super low. You know, people often think, "Well, I'm gonna wait until I know more before I go start a business." And you know, the, the truth is, you never know enough to start a business. And in fa- in fact, your your naivete ends up working into your advantage because you do things that no one else would do. You know, monitoring, for example, monitoring in as a way to make sure that a baby is healthy is something that was actually tried in like the late 80s, early 90s. So anyone within industry think thought and still a, a lot of them think this is a bad idea. It's like, no, 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 we tried that, doesn't work, you know. And so as outsiders that didn't know any better, when we heard that and they said, no, 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 we tried it, it doesn't work, you know, these kids that were just like, no, but we think it does, so we're going to build it, you know. Like we just – you can – flat out disagree and that's like a a a benefit of of not knowing any better um i think i got off on a tangent of just starting starting a startup when you're young um but yeah i was really lucky to to be part of phone soap and uh be kind of engaged on these questions of of asking customers how does this work and and then after phone soap um they uh we went separate ways and i can't even actually remember why I was, I think, I can't remember, but I tried another startup and it failed within like six months and then I, I moved to Owlet. So I've got a bit more experience, but I'm, I'm overjoyed that, that I can put phone soap on, on my name too. It's such a fun experience. So what's next? Oh, what's next? Gosh. I don't even know. Um... I always just say that I'm going to stick with Owlet until it's no longer fun. We've got $300 million, and so I think I've got a lot more time to have fun. I think I'll be there for a few more years. Um, I'm talking to other founders and, and uh, from other companies, and we're looking at tr- you know wanting to acquire a few businesses, and so that to me is just like a lot of fun. Um, we're you know building out these opportunities within like Connected Nursery and, and Telehealth and Again, I, g- I love the early phase startups. When I, when I talk to founders, I'm like, this is the highlight of my day. Like, being in a big business is kind of boring to me. I love, like, the early founder stuff. And so now, as, you know, within our business, I get to stay in this early founder mode where I'm helping to discover where's the, where's the business going to go next. Um, I think life is, is meant to be kind of iterative and to take tests, so... Uh, my wife and I are taking a test where we're going to go live in Maui for two months and see if we like living in Maui. And then we'll come back and say, do we move to Maui or do we just go to Maui for two months a year or something, right? So I think it's, yeah, I kind of live my life like a startup a little bit. So uh, the existing test is advising, maybe investing in a few startups and, uh, yeah, maybe changing changing location. And so I'm only like, two years ahead in, you know, in the things that I want. There's a few things I write in, like, pen, you know. I, like, there's goals you write in pen, and there's goals you write in pencil. And the ones you write in pen, you kind of stick to those. And you c- the route to get there is often in pencil. You, you're not sure how you quite you get there. But, um, yeah, I feel like I've done a lot of stuff I want to do in life. Though maybe one last thing that's in pen that I haven't uh, done yet is do, like, a trip around the world where I'd love just pick up the kids and, and just travel for a year or so, but um, gosh, you got me on the spot with that that future question. I don't. I'm not totally sure <laughs> what <laughs> I want to do next. So. Uh, we have time for about one or two more questions. So, 
your tangent actually kind of addressed my question a little bit oh, cool. of with the the product i didn't know if there was any sort of baseline of of what you were trying to accomplish uh was it strictly just the 80s that was basically your your only baseline to look at or were there any other innovations going on at the time that you were aware of i'm not i'm not sure i understand is your question completely yeah so Essentially, you wanted to bring this this sock product that can monitor uh, monitor oxygen. Were there any other products that compared um, before you started to build this? Mm. Yeah, um, there there was like that's actually an interesting one too. So there's a lot of like like movement monitors, and so like there's these mats that you can buy, and they've those have been around like five years or. 10 years before Owlet started, and it's like a mat you can put your baby on, and it detects movement of the belly. If it notices the baby's belly stops moving, then it sounds an alarm. And what's interesting is, like, Owlet's not that different, right? We're using a different technology, and so parents believe it more. Um, but on top of that, there's been probably eight other startups that have tried to solve the same problem. Is my baby okay, but with different ways to get there? So some have used, like, cameras that are... Um, you know, sent like using uh, vision to uh, from the camera to tell if the baby's breathing. Others have used like f like a radar, lidar type thing that's scanning the bed and and making sure. Others have used like a wearable onesie. What's interesting is like all of them have failed, and Owlet is is a billion dollar company. Um, but there's not like it's the subtle differences in the product that made the, the all the difference. And so you know as as parents were able to say, I know it pulls oximetry is I've used a little red light in my finger in the hospital, so I trust that thing more than I trust a camera vision thing. I don't know that's real, a, you know, a onesie, a, you know, all these different things. And so um, what's interesting is like, and, and y there's probably the same in like lots of reasons to win, but I think our product market fit was really good, but and, but it was the the subtleties in the, the the product that actually made the difference, even though there's been eight other people try to do similar, solve the same problem with different routes, um, which hopefully as, as an entrepreneur, you can interpret that as, um, you know, this might be different enough t to get there uh, than, than what's already been. It doesn't matter that it's already been done. Maybe maybe you're pursuing it in a different way or, or yeah. So did that answer? I want to know how you came up with the name. Ooh. Uh, I think it was between Owlet and like uh, Night Nanny and like Koala Roo or something. Um, and it wasn't the most logical thing. It was, we liked the tagline of up all night so you don't have to be because an, an owl's awake. And owls weren't actually trendy at the time. We actually beat the trend by uh, like a year or something. And all of a sudden owls started popping up and all this like uh, maternity stuff and, and baby stuff. And we're like, uh, we just kind of lucked out I think with, with the name, but. Yeah. And an owlet is a baby owl, so it made it even better. So followed followed the, the cuteness. There's a whole book actually on how to name your products. And uh I wish I could remember the name of it. Um but it's really good. And he actually uses an analogy. He uses a, a Utah company this uh spoon me the the yogurt one. Mm -hmm. And it gives all the reasons that, that like that was like the perfect name for the business and all the pitfalls to avoid. I don't know the name, th the name of the book, though, but there's a book on how to name your company. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for being here. The last question that we always ask our founders is, what is something fun that your success has allowed you to do? Oh, man. Uh, just meet a lot of cool people. Um, I've got a, I've, yeah, I've met Mark Cuban and Richard Branson and, uh, like, just a lot of really smart entrepreneurs um, I think entrepreneurs are the coolest people, the coolest people on the planet. Like we think so much differently than anybody else. Like I could get in a room and talk with entrepreneurs for hours on where the world's going to be and you know, what technologies are, are, are going to improve people's lives. And I just, I think we're the coolest people ever. And, and that's probably one of the, the funnest things. 
Well, so. I will tell you what. We know of a place that always has entrepreneurs. So you are welcome in the Rev Road office anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Jordan, thank you so much for being here. We have a little gift for you. Thank you. We appreciate your time and your presence and your wisdom. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Jordan. Thanks.